we did finally have a revolt, 1936, 1937. I think the British have to deploy about 100,000 troops to crush it. Um, it, it, it essentially uh, made the 1948 effort to defy the armed uh, Zionist uh, movement that seized most of historic Palestine, but the the it, it was timing. I mean that revolt, uh, which was crushed, essentially weakened uh, the Palestinians to such an extent that by 1948 there was very little they could do to resist. Uh, and and we can talk about that mythic narrative of what is it six Arab nations attacking. Um, um, and that's, of course, uh, hyperbolic rhetoric, given the reality of what happened on the ground. But but uh, th that resistance, as you point out in your book, f was from the inception. Originally, it was nonviolent. And then, uh, of course, a being cut off right and left and ignored, it, it erupted into violence. Absolutely. I, I mean, the history of anti-colonialist movements, in very few cases, you have pacifist <laughs> anti-colonialist movement. So yes, violence eventually is employed by those who rebel against colonization and, and oppression. Uh, but uh, this is uh, a violence which is employed for, uh, for existential reasons, uh, in order to prevent being colonized, uh, and not in the case of Palestine, not just being colonized, but being ethnically cleansed from Palestine. Uh, so, so nobody says that they haven't, you know, eventually used, uh, didn't use an armed struggle. But what is for me so interesting, and again, this comes to me as one of the achievements of the lobby, that even years later, you know, when you narrate anti-colonialist movements in Africa, Latin America, and Asia, you know, many years later, uh, uh, people say, no, this, these were noble, you know, movements of liberation whether they were more violent or less violent, and they were right to demand that the colonialist empires would leave the colonies and would allow them to be independent. The great success of the lobby was that many years later, this uh, natural, justified impulse of people to revolt against an attempt to both colonize them and then uproot them, for years was still regarded as terrorism for the sake of terrorism. You know, something that comes out of a cultural culture of violence and not out of the reality of oppression. And, and I would say that even today in Britain and the United States, I can find a lot of educated people who would still say, well, what the Palestinians are doing is really terrorism. And it goes back to that period because uh, 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 definitely in pro-Israeli narratives in American and British academia, the revolt we are talking about, 1936 to 1939, and even the Palestinians' attempts to prevent the ethnic cleansing of 1948 are still narrated as the early acts of terrorism, uh, you know, motivated by anti-Semitism uh, and by culture of violence, rather than uh, a classical case of colonized people trying to prevent the colonization of their homeland. Well, when the Zionist militias pre-1948 attempt to drive the British out. They employ the tactic of terrorism, like all resistance movements, like Hamas. Uh, the, the terrorism, unfortunately, uh, the ANC, the, the FLN in Algeria, that is uh, in the tool bag, uh, unfortunately, of anti-colonial resistance forces. But of course, they, they put a bomb in a satchel or a suicide vest because they don't have an air force. They don't have the tools of, uh, let's call it, state or industrial terror. Yeah. But I do think the Zionist terrorism uh, was much, uh, is, is, is more like the one used by the French settlers in Algeria when the French government decided to end French rule in Algeria. Uh, so so um, uh, this is where the, the settlers feel that the empire, uh, according to them, should do two things. It should, of course, leave, but it, it should help it, them to take over the country, which the British didn't do. Contrary, by the way, 
to history books that claim that Britain kind of in 48 helped the Zionists to take over Palestine. No, the, their sin was being actually neutral, not doing anything, which was as bad as doing something. Uh, but but this, this is really what is so fascinating about it, that again, the narrative then becomes of uh, uh, the Jewish terrorists becoming the freedom fighters of the future, uh, and the Palestinians still remain in the image in the West of continuing being a terrorist rather than uh, trans being transformed in the public eye as so many uh, people were transformed eventually like Mandela or the leaders of the FLM or, or Nakruma, uh, uh, people who were fighting against, the, uh, not to mention Gandhi, people who were fighting against the British Empire and later on were recognized as leaders of the independent, decolonized world. Somehow, uh, and, and I think this is the success of the lobby, was not allowing the Palestinians to fall into that category where, where you are being seen differently once there is a healthy moral uh, objection to colonialism uh, when the world is being decolonized. I mean, the only difference is that, of course, the French settlers in Algeria were angry because de Gaulle and the French planned to leave. Uh, whereas the Zionists wanted the British to leave. Um, yeah, yeah that, that's uh, true. That's true. Uh, so throughout this period, and this has crippled the Palestinians, you write they had nothing equivalent to the Zionist lobby, and their leadership had no idea what a powerful enemy they were facing. I, of course, covered Arafat. That was as true for the PLO as it was in the 1920s. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's quite incredible, and I think part of this naive belief that the leaders had, that after all, they were the majority of the land, of the people in the country. They uh, had the promises from the international community. Uh, they were, the Arab world was around them and would certainly help them. All that led to certain passivity uh, uh, compared to the very effective uh, mechanism of the Zionist lobby. But I think, you know, I, I'm, I can in retrospect uh, uh, un unravel, uh, unpack how powerful the Zionist lobby was. I, I don't underestimate how difficult it would have been from uh, Palestine to, to understand it. 70% <clears throat> of the Palestinians were living in rural Palestine, in villages, World politics were hardly of any interest to them. Uh, the idea that someone in London, in Washington, was helping other people, foreign people, to plan their uh, uh, uprooting, their displacement, uh, was very far from their agenda. They, they could not even begin to think about it. And uh, it's very interesting to, to compare the kind of negotiations which the Zionist leaders have with the British Empire and later with the United Nations and the Palestinian leaders have uh, with them. Uh, uh, the Palestinians are, are kind of keep repeating this idea that surely the principle of democracy and self-determination is on their side, as if there is no cynical game that could really be more important than the pledges made to them by the international community. Whereas the Zionists all the time assume that what matters is hardly any pledges or any international decisions. You know, even the partition plan is very clear. That ben Gurion tells the, the people in London, forget about the partition plan. That what was important is recognition, recognition in recognition of the um, uh, of the Jewish state. But that was not uh, important. The partition plan itself was not important because Israel's border would, it, would, it would be determined by the army and the alliances that it would have uh, in the world and so on. Uh, it was a very different take on the code of behavior in the region and in the international community that allowed the Zionist movement to build a very strong alliance and the Palestinians were not able to, to match it in any way. 